My name is Marnie Escaf, and I'm the Clinical Vice President at University Health Network and located at the Toronto General Hospital. I'm very pleased to welcome you here today on behalf of our hospital to another exciting behind the scenes lecture. The behind the scenes lectures were developed to provide you with an exclusive view of how our scientists and clinicians discover, develop, and refine the best treatments for our patients. It is our way of showing you how grateful we are for the support and using this opportunity to thank you for your generous gifts to our hospitals. It is a pleasure to see so many of our donors taking an active interest in the work that we do by attending these lectures. There's so much to share with you about the innovations in our programs and practices that transform patient care. Especially exciting for the Toronto General Hospital is the new multi-purpose operating room in the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre. Ladies and gentlemen, today's presentation showcases the tremendous leap in cardiac operating standards that are giving patients the opportunity to lead a much better quality of life than ever before. I'd like to now invite Louise Aspen, Vice President of Advancement at the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation, to introduce our guest speaker. Please welcome Louise Aspen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation. I am lucky enough this afternoon to be introducing Dr. Barry Rubin. Dr. Rubin is the Program Medical Director at the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre and Head of the Division of Vascular Surgery at the University Health Network. The Peter Monk Cardiac Centre provides world-class cardiovascular care and is one of the largest programs of its kind in North America. Thanks to the work of outstanding physicians like Dr. Rubin, the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre receives major referrals and handles the most complex cases in Canada. Dr. Rubin is also Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Toronto and President of the University Health Network, Mount Sinai Hospital Health Practitioners Funding Group, which represents 600 physicians at the Toronto General, the Toronto Western, Princess Margaret and Mount Sinai Hospitals. His training began at McGill Medical School and he graduated from the University of Toronto to join UHN. He is the recipient of several awards and leads a tertiary quaternary care practice in vascular surgery and manages patients with a wide range of vascular disease. Dr. Ribbon developed a protocol to evaluate the venous system in patients with leg ulcers and is one of two surgeons only in Ontario who does laparoscopic venous perforator ligation a minimally invasive procedure to tie off damaged veins. Ladies and gentlemen, please introduce, or please welcome, Dr. Barry Rubin. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's actually an honor. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the development of the multipurpose operating room at the Toronto General Hospital. Better imaging in the operating room equals better patient outcomes. It wasn't me who said this, it was Fraser Elliott who said it a long time ago. And it's taken from this time when Mr. Elliott in, uh, gave a donation uh, to support the develop development of this room until January of this year to open this room. But it's a fantastic room. So this is what a standard operating room looks like at UHN. This is one of the new ORs. It's a pretty crowded place, but there's nothing in there that allows you to do imaging during a case. If you want to do imaging, you have to wheel one of these units into the room. This is a portable angio unit. It's bulky. It generates a lot of heat. It doesn't work well for long periods of time as opposed to an installed unit. And if you imagine putting that in here, it's pretty crowded. So we decided that we wanted to design and build an operating room that had the ability to do imaging in the room during an operation. So we had to be able to do standard operations. We wanted to be able to do advanced operations that required a combination of imaging and surgery. We wanted the functionality to exist to both diagnose and treat every kind of cardiovascular disease that a patient could present with, both electively and on an emergent basis. And importantly, we wanted to realize Mr. Elliott's vision of high-quality intraoperative imaging. So this is what we started with. 
when the new clinical services building was built, there were 4,000 square feet set aside as a let's build something later that's really great, but we don't know exactly what kind of room. Uh, this is the view out the window to University Avenue, and uh, this is a really big space. I suggested we use it for ball hockey, but that didn't fly. So we did a lot of planning. There were about three years' worth of meetings, uh, extensive design, every conceivable issue we thought we had addressed, and this is what we were shooting for. So this is an artist's rendition of a room that has... Actually, do I have a... Is there a pointer? Um, I can use it as we go along. So this is a room with everything on the ceiling, uh, except for the CT scanner and the patient's bed. There's an angiography unit, and we planned on building this to about double the size of a standard operating room at UHM. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of construction. This was actually after we poured the concrete initially. Then the floor had to be perfectly level in order for there to be an angio unit in the room with the CT scanner. Then we uh, moved along. Thanks very much, Marnie. Uh, we moved along, and this shows the uh, CT scanner. Oop. Yeah, the CT scanner and the angio unit being assembled. Uh, here we're just about finished, and the room opened in January of this year. This room is 1,300 square feet. The smallest operating room at UHN is 575, and the biggest about 800. So this is massive by comparison to the other rooms. And the reason it's so big is to accommodate the CT scan unit, the angio machine, the different monitors. There's actually one of these on both sides. So if you're standing on this side of the bed, you can look this way. And if you're on this side of the bed, you can look over here. And also, we can bring a pump into this room to do a cardiac bypass, essentially any procedure that would be required. And this is an artist rendition of what the room looked like as appeared in the Globe and Mail earlier this year. So what we have is a state-of-the-art, integrated, digital angiography CT scan unit, the only one of its kind in Canada. This enables two types of imaging of superior quality. Angiography for two-dimensional images of blood vessels, that could be coronary arteries or any other artery in the body, and CT scan to provide real-time high-resolution, three-dimensional imaging. We thought that this would be an ideal environment to provide the advanced therapies that we want to be able to provide in the Peter Monk Cardiac Center and to combine both operative and interventional approaches. I'm going to review two types of procedures, two classes of procedures today, elective procedures, endovascular aneurysm repair and percutaneous aortic valve repair, and some emergency procedures, how we manage patients with a ruptured aorta, a patient that we did an aortic valvuloplasty on who was pregnant, removal of a clot of a leg artery on an emergency basis, and how we manage severe chest pain of unknown etiology. So this is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's the normal part. Oh, this is uh, fading. If there's another one, if there's another pointer, that might be a, a good thing. You can see there's a normal part that's higher up, and then it balloons out, and this is just like a balloon. The bigger it gets, the more likely it is to break, and if it breaks, most people don't survive. So we used to repair these through relatively long incisions, and that would require about 10 days in hospital and two months to get over, and if you have other medical problems, this isn't an option. Uh, this is an invasive procedure. I've chosen the drawings, not the actual intraoperative pictures. And there's nothing new about it, as you can see. It's 60 years old. More recently, we went to inserting stents inside of blood vessels to repair aneurysms. You can see that there's small groin incisions in this patient. And if you look closely, you can see the two other scars in the abdomen from previous surgeries. So we do this by inserting a stent inside a vessel in the groin and sliding it up into the belly. And I'm going to show you how we do this. So that's what a stent graft looks like. It has multiple components, and you build it from the inside. This is a whole new world for vascular surgery because we were trained to make big incisions, big operations. Now we make small incisions, or as I'll show you later, no incisions, but we use a whole different set of tools now than I was originally trained with, catheters and wires. So when you have these wires that can be six or seven feet long, you need a lot of space as they go into a patient, either through their arms or their legs, and that's one of the reasons why the room is so big. So this is a picture or a cartoon of an endovascular aneurysm repair. 
What you see here is a wire going up from the groin, and this device, which is about four feet long, which has the stent graft inside it. This is positioned under X-ray guidance and deployed. You see that there's the limb on the other side that we've just put a wire through. Now the top of the graft has been deployed just below the kidney arteries. The branch on the other side is being inserted. And then we will complete delivery of the original side, release the graft completely. So now it's a free structure and then put in a, an extension so that we're only landing in totally normal artery. And then you put in a balloon so that you mold the graft to the blood vessel at the top end and at the bottom end uh, where it's attached because you can't have any leaks in this. So this procedure has um, really taken over from open surgery. We've done 500 at UHN. And it's actually now rare for us to do an open um, abdominal approach to, an, to uh, an aneurysm repair. So this is a picture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. In the panel on your left-hand side is a normal-sized aorta, and on the right-hand side, the white structure shows the enlarged aorta. And this is a picture of us repairing that aneurysm. So this is one of the first cases that we did in the multipurpose OR. You see the CAT scanner in the background the angio unit at the front of the picture, the patient is on the table. And we're just getting ready to start operating. Uh, this is a shot of the surgeons doing the procedure. And one of the messages I'm going to get across to you today, I hope, is that we work in multidisciplinary teams in this room. This is not just vascular surgery. So the person who is on, uh, well, I guess I'm, the, the person who's in the foreground on the left-hand side is my partner, Dr. Lindsay. The person standing next to him is a trainee in vascular interventional radiology. The person on the other side of the screen is the scrub nurse and a trainee in vascular surgery. And the person in the background is one of the staff vascular interventional radiologists. So we work together, leveraging the expertise of both radiology and surgery to take care of these patients. Uh, that's just a picture of the CAT scanner uh, taken off to the side. And here we're, he would just be about finishing the operation. And that's the end result. You don't see the bulge anymore. All you see is the stent graft. And that's where the blood is flowing. So you don't take out the aneurysm. You just line the old tube, rusted out, with a new tube. So we thought, given that we now have this outstanding imaging, would it be possible to repair an aneurysm without making an incision? A completely impossible type of scenario, even a few years ago. So this is a patient that has very severe comorbidities, chronic lung disease, multiple previous heart attacks, and a large abdomen who would be judged to be at risk for any type of surgery. So this is his aneurysm before surgery, and this is his aneurysm after. And you can see that there's no bulge. There's only blood flowing through the stent graft. This took about three hours to do. And this patient went home on the second post-operative day. Now, what's most impressive is that we didn't make any incisions in this patient. This is an all-percutaneous approach. You can see that the actual defects in the skin are on the orders of millimeters. And we think that with this technology, the future in vascular surgery is no incision, all-percutaneous, same-day aortic surgery. Totally unbelievable. So just to review, where we've, this is where we were. This is a couple of years ago with small incisions. And this is today with no incisions, all because of the advanced imaging capabilities in the multipurpose OR. A second procedure that we're doing in the multipurpose OR is repair of the aortic valve by a percutaneous approach. The old way of doing this through a sternotomy and uh, opening, putting the patient on circulatory arrest or heart bypass and um, opening the arch is an invasive procedure, and it leads to a big scar, reminiscent of the way that we used to do open aneurysm surgery. So it was felt that eliminating the need for sternotomy could decrease the morbidity and possibly the mortality of this procedure, and more so, you might be able to offer this procedure to patients who just wouldn't be candidates to have an open approach. And one of the worst feelings in medicine is when you meet a patient in the office and you tell them that there's no options for treatment because you're worried that the treatment will kill them. 